We're very pleased to have Dr. John Kutcher here this morning. He has been a professor at Rutgers University since 1978, conducting research on transportation economies and finance, urban travel behavior, transportation systems, and government policies in the US, Canada, Australia, and Europe. Over the past 15 years, John's research has focused on walking and bicycling and how to improve their safety and convenience for all age groups, for women as well as men, and for all levels of physical ability. His four decades of research throughout the world show that the full integration of walking and cycling with public transit is key to providing a feasible alternative to the car. John has published three books and over a thousand articles in academic and professional journals. Sorry, 100 articles. <laughs> <laughs> His most recent book is entitled City Cycling, published by MIT Press in 2012. John has spent several years as a visiting professor at universities in Germany, Canada, and Australia. And I, I had the, the pleasure of doing one of your bike tours with John yesterday, and I thought he was quite a character. So I do look forward to his, his, speaking, his speaking this morning. Thank you very, very much. I am just thrilled to be in Toronto. This is my first time in 10 years. I've been to Toronto many times. Uh, but that bike tour that Dan Egan gave us yesterday just uh, knocked my socks off. I mean, this, the amount of progress that's been made here in Toronto in these last few years is amazing. So anyway, I'm very glad uh, to be here in Toronto. Many, many thanks to Nancy and to the uh, Center for Active Transportation here in Toronto. Many, many thanks. It's my privilege to be here uh, to speak uh, before you. You might wonder, um, I do research on walking and cycling and, and public transit and why maybe you're talking about complete streets? Well, I think that streets are our most important public spaces mm -hmm. by far. And that they belong to all of us, not just to motorists. And that's really the key thing, in a way, in all the research that I've done. How we use our streets is really, really, really important for so many reasons. It's important for transportation, obviously. It's important for the environment. It's important for public health and for safety. It's important for the economy. It's important for uh, something that's very close and dear to my heart, and that is social justice. In my talk, what I'll be emphasizing is the role that complete streets play in encouraging walking and cycling. But I think that complete streets are even more important than that. I think complete streets are absolutely crucial in making uh, for the well-being of our cities and, in fact, for our societies as a whole. So I think this uh, complete streets movement is a really, really crucial, crucial movement in our society. So how do we make complete streets? Lots of different ways. Some of them are obvious. Some of them are not so obvious. Uh, we clearly want to improve our sidewalks, our intersections, uh, pedestrian crossings, improve signaling for pedestrians, we want to add and improve the safety, the comfort, the flexibility, the connectivity of our bikeway network. Um, and we also want to, I think, uh, make sure uh, that we have as many as possible of our residential streets being traffic calmed at 30 kilometers an hour or less and have sections of those, in fact, which are home zones or play streets, so the different uh, terminologies, Warners and, and uh, Dutch, uh, where children feel free to play in the streets, where you can easily bicycle or walk in the streets, talk to your neighbors in the streets, really make it part of your neighborhood. Uh, I'm going to be doing research on five cities in Europe right now, Vienna, Munich, uh, Hamburg, Berlin, and Zurich. About 80% of the residential streets are traffic calm at 30 kilometers or less. And about half of those are then these sort of play zones or home zones uh, of seven kilometers or less. And that is then a great environment, especially for kids who cycle, start cycling at least, and walking in their own neighborhoods. Uh, one of the things that I don't think I have to convince any of you of is that walking and cycling are the most sustainable of all modes of transportation. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, but there are really all the World Bank defines sustainability on three indices, economic, social, and environmental. We usually think of the environmental, so that's sort of a no-brainer. Walking and cycling are the most environmentally friendly modes of transportation. 
transportation, but they're also the most economical. They cost the least for government to provide walking and cycling facilities. They cost the least for individuals. They're also extraordinarily healthy. They do save you time. It turns out, for every hour you walk or cycle, just remember this, for every hour you walk or cycle every day, you add more than an hour to your expected healthy lifetime. <laughs> Next time someone tells you you're wasting your time walking your time, you just tell them that. Well, unfortunately, we don't do very well here in North America when it comes to walking and cycling. It's a little bit difficult. If you see the Canadian asterisk, says, like, that's because there is actually no travel survey in Canada. Uh, so those are work trips that are reported by, or used to be at least, reported by the census. <laughs> uh, I think now there's a real problem even with that data. Uh, but, uh, most developed countries do have to have national travel surveys that include walking and cycling and all modes of transportation for all three purposes. And so that's what you see to the right of this particular graph. What you see, the really important thing is, these countries that you see to the right hand part of the side, Netherlands, Denmark, uh, Germany, and so forth, these are countries with very high per capita incomes. No claim that they're cycling because they're poor, because they can't afford a car. Well, Germany has one of the highest levels of car ownership in the world. You know, ever heard of Mercedes, Audi, Volkswagen? <laughs> they're all big. BMW, they're German. The, the German auto industry accounts for 20% of their economy. That's twice the percentage in the United States. And you might ask them, how is it that they get away with this in Germany, in a sense? <laughs> how do they get to implement such pro-walk, pro-bike, pro-transit policies in Germany where the car industry is so important? Well, that's an issue we'll get into later. But anyway, look, the, the main thing I wanted to show you is that it's not true that you have to be a poor country in order to get people on their bikes or walking that even in very affluent countries, uh, you could have very, very high levels of walking and cycling. The other issue is that uh, Europeans bike for a much, much wider range of purposes. Uh, certainly not just for recreation. In the United States, I'm not exactly sure what the percentage is in Canada, and you don't know either, <laughs> because you don't have a national travel survey. <laughs> uh, in the United States, it's about 80% recreational. Recreational, sports, exercise, some combination of that. Um, whereas in, in Europe, it's a much, much higher percentage of utilitarian trips. In fact, the, the woman who's the head of statistics for the Ministry of Transport in, in Denmark told me that, because I saw a statistics, like 80% of their trips are like utilitarian, or 90%. I said, can that be true? She says, no, we don't just bike around for fun here in the Netherlands. We want to get from point A to point B. So that was a real uh, interesting uh, point for me when I discovered that statistic. The other, I think, really important issue is we have a huge uh, gender gap when it comes to cycling. There's just no really big difference in walking and cycling between men and women, but a huge gender gap uh, for actually almost all English-speaking countries. It includes the UK. It's even worse in Australia. So about 18% of all bike trips are made by women in, the, in Australia. It's about, if I can read it correctly, my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it is, it's a very low percentage. So 30% in Canada, 27% in the UK, 25% um, in the United States. So clearly, something's wrong. And in fact, I have colleagues, um, uh, Jan Girard, Susan Handy, and Jennifer Dill, who did the chapter on women in cycling. And uh, Jan, in fact, describes women, these are all women, she describes women as an indicator species of cycling, that if you see a lot of women on bikes, you're doing something right when it comes to cycling policy. If you're only seeing young men on bikes, you're doing something wrong, because it means the, the conditions of cycling are simply not convenient, they're not comfortable enough, they're not safe enough. And by the way, in terms of uh, cycling, 55% of all bike trips in Denmark, in fact by women, and by the way, it's 56% in the, in the Netherlands, and it's not just a northern European phenomenon. I did a study of cycling in Japan, and it's over 50% of bike trips in Japan are by women. So it's sort of, we're the, what's wrong with us? <laughs> Why is it that we don't have as many women on bikes? Well, Jan, again, Jan, Jennifer, and Susan did this particular graphic, which shows that uh, the more women you get on bikes, the more bicycling there is in cities overall, and the higher the bike mode share overall, the more women you get on bike. It's sort of, it's not clear exactly, it's probably a bi-directional sort of um, impact, but it's really, really important that we, well, they put it in a different way. Ask women what they want and give it to them. 
So, I mean, that's basically what they're saying. And if you really want to have a successful bicycling policy, cater to the needs of women, because women are going to have a tremendous impact also on getting kids cycling and senior cycling, and it's going to, that's what's going to really make it a, a mass cycling movement, such as you see, say, in the Netherlands or Denmark, where you get everyone on bikes for every purpose. Another issue, a really important issue, is age. You may not want to admit it, but each and every one of us is getting older and older. <laughs> one year at a time. I know I am. And I want to be able to walk and cycle as I get older. And I have been so far. But what's really interesting is, in the United States at least, and I'm not sure what the attitude is here in Canada, in the United States, we sort of assume, well, as you get older and older, you're going to walk less and less, you're going to bike less and less, especially you're going to bike less and less. Getting on a bike when you're older is the most awesome possibility in the United States. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at this graph, it shows just the opposite. As the Danes, the Germans, and the Dutch get older, they're walking and biking more and more. Which is interesting. Look at just the, I gotta figure out, pick out one thing. I know I gotta look at the watch too, but if you just look at the look at Denmark, the age group 70 to 84. And we have here 20, or was it 50, 15 percent of the trips made by bike. That's really just incredible. I mean, it's just inconceivable in the United States. <coughs> normal here in Canada, but I think it's, going to, uh, it's something really important to take into account because all of our societies are aging. A higher and higher percentage, older than 65, older than 70, older than 75. How are you getting around? I don't like to be in my neighbor's family, or friends, or chauffeur me around, or a once a day dial ride sort of a service. I want to be able to walk and bike. And it's healthy for you too, it really, really is. So I think cycling should really be for all ages, and it should be for all abilities. And these are friends of mine, Anne and Mike, and they gave me special permission to show the slide. And that is, yeah, some people think, well, if you have a disability, you just can't possibly bike. And there are certainly uh, certain kinds of disabilities where that's true. But in fact, Anne is a paraplegic. temporary one, but making things accessible for people with disabilities is for us, it's not just for them, because we will, at some time in our lifetime, probably have some sort of a limitation on our mobility. So we really need to make walking and cycling safe for everyone, this is particularly important for women as it turns out, for kids, for seniors, for anyone who's Lots of trucks and buses and heavy traffic is just not going to happen. I'll go off on the sidewalk if I have to. But I can tell you the bike ride that I had yesterday with Dan Eager, which was fantastic by the way, and it was almost all on separate bike facilities. They were buffered bike lanes, contraflow lanes, uh, uh, buffered bike lanes, the um, cycle tracks that were protected from the motor vehicle traffic. Really an incredible. I think it took us, it was, oh, I didn't think it was possible, two full hours on only separate bike facilities. It was really like quite a feat. But I felt very comfortable. I didn't feel any effort that I was really in danger. And I think that's one of the things that's really important. Um, so how do we make cycling safe? Well, first of all, I suppose I should ask, uh, how unsafe is cycling or how safe can you make cycling? And first of all, I think it's Denmark and the Netherlands. These are injury and fatality rates measured uh, per kilometer and also per trip. And you can see that in the Denmark, Denmark and Netherlands, that cycling and walking are much safer than they are in Germany and the UK, but they're especially safer than in the United States. I mean, ugh, oh, I mean, my hands on my face, I'm ashamed to be an American. <laughs> look, how, look how unsafe they are. Now, you're lucky that you don't have a national travel survey. <laughs> <laughs> It makes it impossible to produce these graphs in Canada because you have to know the total number of kilometers walked, by and so forth and so on. And it's a, the, the survey just doesn't exist for Canada. If I had to guess, I would guess you're somewhere between the UK and the United States. But 
but I, I think you're better than the United States because I know that your traffic fatality rate per capita is much, much better. It's lower than it is in the United States. So my guess is for walking and cycling is also safer than it is in the United States. But there's no way to know for sure because there's no travel survey. <laughs> now, Canada actually does pretty well. Uh, this is the first time, this is the first time anyone has ever seen this particular graph. This is really new. We got statistics just, I guess it was two weeks ago, from uh, Canada. Uh, and then put these together with new statistics from the EU to look back from 1975 all the way to the current era and how Canada compares with the EU countries and the United States. Well, again, we in the United States have done a really lousy job because basically we're foremost level. What's happened is there's a huge reduction in childhood cycling because parents won't let their kids get on bikes. And an increase in adult cycling and the increase in adult uh, injuries on bike has sort of offset the increase in child injuries, so you just about, not, not just about even. In Canada, I don't know the explanation for why, but it's gotten just about relative to 1975, the beginning year here, everything's relative to 75. That's really fine. You're probably the same categories as European countries. So you can be proud of that. And likewise with pedestrian fatalities. This is again as a percentage of 1975. So it's not, not per mile or per trip, but relative to what the level was in 1975. Uh, again, Canada is much, 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 much better than the United States. You're proud to be Canadian, not Americans. <laughs> uh, those of you who are Canadian. Um, <laughs> And, by, and, and uh, I, I looked at this check. The, the rate of population growth is just about the same in two countries. There's almost no difference at all, maybe one or two percentage points. So it's not the case that one country is growing so much faster than another. And I would argue, especially uh, when we go back to the cycling slide, cycling is about three times the level of cycling per capita in, in Canada as in the United States. So it's not a matter of having a low level of cycling, and that's why you have few cycling fatalities. That's not at all. I do think that cycling is much safer in Canada, and the traveling in general is safer in Canada than the United States. Safety in numbers are a really important concept. Because that is, you get more people on bikes, it becomes safer and safer. More people walking, it becomes safer and safer. And this particular graph just uh, makes New York look pretty bad, but I don't want to uh, and, Make it look New York look bad because I think New York does a lot better than the statistics show here. But basically, what this is showing is the higher the bike mode share, um, the safer cycling is. And Vancouver here is shown to have the safest cycling of any of the cities. We did a, a study, I guess it was nine. We had a study for the U.S. Department of Transportation. There were nine North American cities, three from Canada, six from the United States. And all of these, Vancouver was the site, it was the site. There's Toronto is pretty safe too, even though it has a significantly lower, sort of one of the outliers, a lower uh, bike mode share. But Canadian cities do pretty well, uh, city to city basis, uh, compared to the United States. You might think, well, these European countries were always very pro bike, there were lots of cycling, everything was just uh, hunky dory and wonderful. But it's not true. 1950s, 1960s, Canadian city. <laughs> European cities pretty much followed the American example of adapting your cities to the car. Just build more and more roads, more and more parking lots, bicycling and walking were pretty much ignored, uh, and then there was a tremendous, dramatic turnaround in policy in the 1970s. It was discovered cars are destroying our cities, they're destroying the environment, the rate of pedestrian and cyclist fatalities was skyrocketing, they had the energy crisis, the environmental movement, everything sort of came together to produce a dramatic shift in public policy in European cities. Just as one example of this, this is the same exact bridge in Freiburg, Germany, before and after. Before, it was a bridge for cars, now it's a bridge for cyclists, and for pedestrians as well. They're off, you can't see them, but they're off to the side of these blue barriers here. Another example of this is traffic calming of residential streets, which I had mentioned before. You see the street before on the left-hand side, the exact same street on the right-hand side, traffic calm. This is not an isolated example, as I mentioned before. Even in cities like Berlin, in Hamburg, in Munich, in smaller towns as well, you're talking about 80 to 90 percent of residential streets are traffic calm in this way, to 30 kilometers an hour, and they're traffic calm with these infrastructure changes that force cars to slow down, force cars 
and motorists to look out for pedestrians and cyclists and kids playing in the streets. And it has dramatically improved the safety of walking and cycling. And by introducing these measures of traffic calming, much a huge expansion and improvement in bicycling and walking <coughs> facilities, but here you see, especially for cycling, a doubling or tripling of cycling in these cities in Northern Europe. So I guess the point here I'm trying to make is, it wasn't always the case that cycling was as thriving in those cities as it is now. You have, a, what is it, a tripling in Nuremberg, a doubling, or in Munich, in fact, it's even more now, I happen to be doing a study on Munich, and it's up to 70 per, 17 percent of all trips by bike. But even look at these two cities of Amsterdam and Copenhagen. I mean, you probably think, oh, they were always bike havens, just a, a paradise for bicycling. But look how they increased as well, 27 percent to 27, 28 percent. So there are a lot of improvements being made to bicycling facilities, even in Copenhagen and Amsterdam, and it led to a big increase then in cycling. Uh, there are a number of cities, both in North America and elsewhere, who have not had a long tradition of cycling, but they have adopted pro bike policies, and as a result, this is what you get. In Paris, <coughs> with Belly, for example, with a number of other measures as well, uh, they're now at actually over 3% of trips by bike. Uh, Bogota, Colombia is sort of the famous example. We have almost a tenfold increase in cycling. Sevilla, about a tenfold increase. These are, these are all of these cities are, are cities without any real tradition of cycling, and that they had a real boom in cycling. Uh, in looking at North American cities, this is our study really for DOT, um, and it includes Canada as well, of course, but you see in all of these cities, 1990, uh, through 2011, and by the way, if you go to 2013, which was just released, it's even higher. So New York is no longer 0.9, it's like 1.1 1 .1 or 1.2 or something like that. But it's all of these have just continued to increase and increase. So it shows even in cities with no culture, no tradition of cycling, if you implement the right policies, cycle tracks, traffic calming, various other kinds of policies, uh, you can do a lot to increase cycling. And in fact, there's lots of things you can do to increase cycling. I gotta hurry up, I got six minutes. <laughs> okay, Nancy. Right. So we have a whole set of policies. I mean there's infrastructure policies, which I will emphasize in this talk because it's not complete streets, but I can tell you there's a lot of other things that go along with it. Integration of walking and cycling, traffic calming, mixed use zoning, so there's land use policies involved, restrictions on car use increasing the price of parking, increasing the cost of having a car, using a car, parking a car, um, increase of making it almost impossible for cars to get through the city center, and so forth. Traffic education is key, and traffic regulations and enforcement. I personally would better be motorist in jail, but that's something else. <laughs> sort of reveals my prejudice here. Uh, but clearly you have to provide an environment for walking and cycling. This happens to be the main street of Munster, where I live for almost three years. And it's a perfect place for walking and cycling. And I know there's a big controversy about helmets and no helmets. No one wears a helmet in Munster. No one wears a helmet in the Netherlands. And everyone feels perfectly safe. And you know, I'm not going to get to that controversy right now. But I can tell you that providing these sorts of car-free environments is absolutely crucial. And it's not just an isolated street. If you look at car-free zones in European cities, it's an integrated network of streets. It's not just one isolated street here or there. And that's what's crucial, having a whole network. Just with, with bicycling, you want a, ne a connected network of bikeways. You also want a connected network of car-free streets, which make it perfect then for walking. One of the nice things like, like this slide is it shows people cycling three abreast, two abreast. It means you can talk. <laughs> You're not by yourself. Someone wants to describe cycling as the loneliest activity on the face of the earth. <laughs> because generally you have very narrow bike lanes. And I remember I was taking a bike ride in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts with a colleague of mine. We were sort of shouting back, we both are deaf, almost deaf. <laughs> we were shouting back and forth to each other instead of being, anyway, it's a socially a fun thing. It's a, certainly more fun talking to someone while you're cycling. And as you can see, it's safe as well. It's completely separated from motor vehicle traffic. This is a, a kind of a cycle track. In fact, it's similar in a way to the one I was riding on yesterday on Trimmer. Um, it had it's separated simply by this curve from the uh, uh, from the lane for the motor vehicle traffic. Uh, but this is one design of a cycle track. But it is kind of a physical separation. It's not dramatic. It's just a curve. 
And likewise, I'm sure during one of the separations, is, it's sort of a little hump, sort of, which is not impossible for a vehicle to get over, but it, it certainly is a physical separation. Montreal has the biggest network, and it has for a long time, had the biggest network of they have bi-directional cycle tracks, and they have a very high level of cycling, they have a very low level of cyclist injuries, they go down and down every year, and this is actually a relatively new cycle track because about 10 years ago or so when I was there, they didn't have it, and it made it so much more convenient, I guess it was a year and a half ago I was there, it made it really much, much better. And by the way, you see this statistic here below, I get it, I'm Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, um, Anne Lusk and her colleagues at Harvard did a study of cycle tracks. Are they safer or not? Well, there was absolutely no question whatsoever. She looked, looked at all the cycle tracks that were in existence in the United States and in Canada, and she found that they were by far much, much, much safer than corresponding facilities that didn't have the cycle track sort of uh, design. And that they also encourage more women cycling, more senior cycling, more kids on bike, and that they increase the overall level of cycling. So cycle tracks are sort of seen as a win-win situation. Safer, uh, more women, more kids, uh, more seniors, and a higher overall level of cycling. Here's a, a slide actually from, US, from New York City DOT, but this is one of, one of their many cycle tracks. They must have like 10 or 12 or 15 by now. But this is one of their first ones. This is on, I think it's on 9th Avenue, go south. And you can see it's completely protected from motor vehicle traffic, special signals so you don't get that hooked by a left turning car or a truck. Um, they've had a huge decrease in cycling injuries, they have a big increase in cycling volumes, and they've also had, sometimes talk about the economic impact of these things, there was a huge increase in retail sales along, in fact, the path of these cycle tracks. So even businesses should be in favor of these cycle tracks. Uh, a friend of mine who's the head bike coordinator for Sydney, Australia, is a big backer of cycle tracks. So she was instrumental in getting cycle, a small network of cycle tracks built in Sydney. And look at what happened. Cycling doubled in Sydney. And over a few years, just through the installation of these cycle tracks, they, they did a special um, estimate. They had a, a, an outside firm do an economic benefit cost analysis of these cycle tracks and they found that the benefits, the economic of the cycle track exceeded their cost by over three to one. So these things are even, from an economic point of view, worth building. If you put in a cycle track, this one's in St. Petersburg, Florida, you get more seniors cycling. In Sevilla, Spain, what a success story. A matter of four or five years, I just got a paper actually three days ago from a professor at the University of Sevilla who documents this in great detail. But a matter of five years, they built a system of over 100 kilometers of cycle tracks and they had a tenfold increase in the level of cycling. I mean, that is really a success story. And, and the injuries, the injury rate per bike trip went, was, went to less than a third of what it was before they built the cycle tracks. So there's absolutely no question the cycle tracks are uh, much, much safer and they encourage much more cycling. Well, these are some uh, facilities. I'm not going to spend too much time on it because you're probably familiar with them, but uh, cycling on every one of these. <laughs> yesterday. So we have, I think Toronto has made a huge amount of progress. Uh, thanks to Dan Egan and his staff uh, here in the uh, city of Toronto, um, putting in uh, the cycle tracks here on Sherburn and also on uh, Simcoe Street. Uh, and some of the cycle tracks, I mean, they're great here in Toronto. Uh, last, uh, I guess it was not 2013 in uh, June, I was in Vancouver and also in Seattle. And wow, I love cycle tracks they've got there. They've got bi-directional cycle tracks for the most part in Vancouver with really nice barriers. I, I know this is going to take a second to explain it, but if you see that barrier they have to the right here in Vancouver, they included lavender in there. I was the slowest cyclist on the face of the earth. Because <laughs> I kept on stopping my bike to smell lavender. <laughs> I mean, wow! Talk about a nice uh, division between the cyclists and the motor vehicles. You couldn't ask for anything. Um, Contrapool Lanes, uh, here, Shaw Street, we went on this one yesterday as well, uh, but there will be, by the end of next year, uh, 22 of these Contrapool Lanes, some people call them yellow lanes, a base base where cycling is allowed in both directions, and what I heard from our bike ride yesterday is that now there are more bicyclists using this facility, this roadway, than there are motorists. So it really has been a very successful policy. It just increases the flexibility of where bikes can go. 
makes things faster, more direct, more convenient for cyclists. This sort of a facility, I was mentioning this to our Dutch colleague uh, either yesterday or today, uh, but this sort of facility in German cities, Dutch cities, they call it a false one-way street, which is where, we, without any markings on the, on the pavement, you simply have a sign at every block that says, bicyclists are exempted from the one-way street, um, you've got one-way traffic, and they can go in either direction, and the motorists just want to expect this on virtually every residential street, that bicyclists are going to go in both directions, even though cars can go in only one direction. But according to, um, as I understand it, because of the, uh, uh, the province of Ontario has standards that won't let you do it the way they do it in Netherlands and in Denmark and in Germany, and they require these special markings. Okay, um, this is, I'm not going to go through the details, I don't have any time for it, but I just want to let you know all the studies that show that when you put in bumper bike lanes or cycle track, we get a huge increase in cycling and a huge decrease in cycling injuries. So that's really important. And when see if someone tells you we just don't have the money to build bike facilities, it's just a bunch of baloney. <laughs> because let me tell you, it's much more expensive to build or widen a road than it is to improve a sidewalk or to build a bike facility. Even the most elaborate cycle trap costs less than the widening of a roadway. So I think that's important to realize. The other thing is, uh, unfortunately, bike lanes are the, in, the, in the United States, at any rate, are the most, most common kind of a licensing facility, but they have their problems. You have people parking in the bike lane, I guess they on the bike tour we took, <laughs> it was my taxi, and we had to get, talk to that driver to let him know he was doing the wrong thing. Um, we had delivery vehicles, you have dooring problems. So bike lanes, in many cases, are better than nothing. Uh, depends on how well they're enforced, really. And in some cities, they're really, really well enforced, so they're great. In other cities, they're not enforced, and they're more problematic. So uh, I think it's important to provide complete streets where you have, this is in Santa Barbara, California, great, great environment for walking, and also a place there to ride your bike. And we have, uh, it's, it's one thing to come up with the center of, of Toronto with lots of really nice bicycling facilities. I think what's really impressive is out in Markham and Unionville um, that they're, they're uh, redoing their street there. It's, I guess it's Highway 7. And they're going to make it into a complete street. They're going to put in a kind of a cycle track. They're going to have a proof sidewalk conditions. The dimensions are sort of changing a little bit, but I think that's, what's, that's where all, most of the growth occurring here in Greater Toronto, and we have to also focus on what's going on out there. I think it just really is great. I can't thank enough the people in Martin for having uh, the courage uh, and the stamina to get this done out there in Martin. If you can do it in Martin, you can do it anywhere. <laughs> um, and if you can do it in North Carolina, you can do it anywhere. This is a, a transformation of exactly the same street from a very incomplete, ugly street to that's exactly the same street, exactly the same intersection. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to tell you the, the bottom one is far, far more attractive than the top one. It's important to have good bicycling facilities over bridges, even during periods of construction. This happens to be in Montreal. And in New York City, the putting great, I mean, they're, they're excellent bicycling facilities now across the river, uh, East River Bridges. And I think it's one of the keys to the bike boom in New York City because there's a lot of bicycling between sort of um, northwestern Brooklyn and lower Manhattan. Uh, absolutely crucial to uh, the success of cycling in New York City. Traffic calming, I'm not going to go through any of this because I'm already over time, but there's lots and lots of different ways you can traffic calm, whether it's traffic circles or zigzag streets or narrowing streets, speed humps, and so forth and so on. And it's important to do this because speed kills. There's no question whatsoever that at a, at a speed limit of over 30 kilometers per hour, you dramatically increase the probability that a uh, pedestrian will be killed in a crash with a uh, motor vehicle. Lots of ways, various illustrations, give median islands, some, uh, some refuge for pedestrians crossing the street. Uh, you can also have these uh, diverters here. Uh, oops, those are the diverters <laughs> in uh, Montreal and Quebec City that we took pictures of. Uh, again, it makes it a sort of a through traffic for a through passage, a cut through for bicyclists and pedestrians, and it's a dead end and, uh, for motorists. Keep, it keeps out through traffic from residential neighborhoods, which is key to increasing the safety of residential neighborhoods. Uh, bicycle boulevards, um, I don't think you've 
White Gap Bicycle Boulevard here in Toronto, but it's a big deal in Vancouver. Vancouver was really the, uh, the leader in North America when it came to bicycle boulevards. Uh, and then Portland took up on it and became famous for it, but actually Vancouver is the one that led the way. Uh, shared streets, and I really got to hurry up now. Uh, this is a very typical new German suburb. This is like a brand new German suburb. It's a totally shared street. There's no sidewalk, there's no bike path, but it's a seven, this is a sign for a play street or a Spielstrasse in German. And so uh, everyone, the, the motorist, is required by law to yield to the kid playing in the street, to the cyclist, to the pedestrian. And so it's truly a shared space. And because it's such a shared space, there's not even special parts of the space designated for the cyclist or the pedestrian or the motor vehicle. And so uh, I think it's a very, very important policy. I'm not going to go through this matrix because it would take forever. But the, the Dutch have, are really the experts, I think, in the world. There's a bicycle planning. And they will say the higher the volume of traffic, the more you have heavy traffic, such as trucks and buses, uh, and the faster the traffic, the more you want that physical separation. And so it's not that you want a cycle track on every single street. It's just not necessary. But on streets with really heavy traffic, fast traffic, with lots of buses and trucks, that's where you most need those uh, separate facilities, such as a cycle track. Uh, kids, I'm almost at the end now. Kids are important. I mean, seniors are important too, I think, because I am one myself. Uh, but kids are important because they're our future. And we all know that kids are not getting enough physical activity. They're not walking or biking to school nearly as much as they used to. Well, this picture was taken by a friend of mine, Fiona Campbell, who in fact is the head bike coordinator for Sydney. And she said, before this cycle track, what you see here is a cycle track. It's a very nice cycle track. They also have a very, very nice uh, barrier between the, uh, the, the cyclists and the motor vehicles. It's even bigger than the one in Vancouver. Before that was built, she said, virtually not a single student cycled to school. After that cycle track was built, a third of the students cycled to school. And so it really <coughs> makes a difference giving uh, kids a safe place to walk and a safe place to cycle to school. Something that blew my mind away, and we're almost at the end now, and that is, this is a study of 20,000 students, 20,000 folks. And what they found is students who biked or walked to school arrived at school awake and ready to learn, more attentive and able to concentrate. They had an advanced mental alertness by half the school year. And now get this, get this folks, those of you who just had breakfast, <laughs> They have more benefit in terms of mental development than having breakfast and lunch. <laughs> I mean, tell that to some parents. <laughs> I mean, they should be at the forefront of pushing policies for complete streets. They should be at the forefront at safe routes to schools. They should be really out there fighting the battle to give their kids that physical activity so they don't become obese, which is a real problem in the United States, but also, I mean, mentally, so that they arrive at school alert, ready to learn. I mean, advanced by half a school year just because they're walking or biking to school? That seems to me like they really... There are a lot of parents out there. They should be on the bad wagon. They, they should be providing the bad wagon for the politicians to get on in order to improve bicycling and walking facilities. This is my next to last slide. Uh, and that is, I'm not, I'm not sure if you have them here in Toronto, but the, the number of open streets events, whatever they call them, different things, different places. Uh, uh, in, in New York, it's Summer Streets. Uh, in Brunswick, it's called Cyclovia. In LA, it's called Cyclavia, and so forth and so forth. They're open streets events. And I think they are important because what they show is streets do not belong to cars, <laughs> they belong to everybody. Whether you're walking or biking or inline skating or skateboarding or wherever it is, just walking around talking to neighbors. We own the streets, and I think the complete streets uh, sort of uh, movement is, is in a way saying we own the streets and we need to take them back because they are one of our most crucial assets in making our societies more livable. Last slide, almost. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really have time to talk about it. <laughs> um, I, have, I have a two-year research project with the Volvo Foundation at Harvard University looking at exactly this issue. This is great that we find out about these policies. You know, what are the policies that, that are implemented in other countries, other cities that have been successful in getting people to walk and bike 
getting kids to walk and bike, reducing the injury rate of uh, walking and cycling, we sort of know what those are. How do we get them politically implemented? That's exactly actually the topic of the research project I'm involved in. But I can tell you there's no one answer. Different cities have different combinations. It may be a, a charismatic political leader, a mayor. It could be a really, really committed, a very professional, extremely competent staff, such as Dan Egan and his staff here in Toronto, and DOT in New York City. I mean, believe you me, they really know what they're doing, and they were really committed to it, and that by Mayor Bloomberg, and they got a lot of stuff done there in New York City. Uh, you look at Bogota, Colombia, and Enrico Peñaloso, or you look at uh, uh, Delano in Paris. Sometimes you really have the combination of, of like, this charismatic political leader who wants to make com streets complete, and then back by NGOs such as the Toronto Center for Active uh, Transportation or Translation Alternatives in New York. They're crucial as well. But the point is that each city has a somewhat different mix, you have a somewhat different history. And so the answer is to how you implement these policies varies somewhat from one city to another, but that's talking itself. And I'll just end on this slide. And that is, I thought, yeah, I got to bring a little bit of French into here. <laughs> you are a bilingual country, right? I mean, you're And I love this. I say, and actually, I, I gave you a slide. I made a mistake when I first did this slide. I said, let's say, les bons tombés, like was plural, and very diplomatically, as, as he always says, Jean-François Ponos uh, said, il y a une petite erreur. It's le beau, singular, even though there's an S on top. Uh, anyway, so I say, laissez les bons tombés en votre envelope, and let's get some women on bikes. <laughs> because they're the, the indicator species that show that in fact you're having a successful bicycling policy. So I, let's hear it for Dan Egan and his <laughs>